How much can you explain to me about the way that security clearance levels work? Because I went down a Wikipedia rabbit hole a while ago and couldn't really work out. And then there's Q level and the... Tell me what you can about how that works. Yeah, so it's a very complicated mess. So I'll tell you what I understand and and fully recognize that there's a thousand people out there who are going to disagree with me because they know something else. And that's totally cool with me. So in large part, secret, secret clearance is the foundation of it all. It's the lowest level of clearance. Um, sometimes you'll see things as confidential or for official use only or um, different different other subcategories. But those categories aren't really a clearance. Like you don't walk around with a, you know, for your eyes only level of clearance. You either walk around with no security clearance or you walk around with a secret level clearance. Secret level clearances are actually so common that there's something called a provisional secret, which means just by applying for a secret level clearance, you get a secret level clearance and it's called a provisional secret clearance. And you have it until you're proven to be somebody that can't be trusted. So once you have that, then all the other clearances stack on top of that. So the first most logical one is top secret. Top secret goes on top of secret. And top secret usually has to do with, uh, with an, an area or an element of, of sensitive information. There's definitions for all of them. Um, so if you can Google them to find out the specific definitions for a level of clearance, right? I think secret is – it could – could potentially do damage to national security. Top secret is could do grave damage to national security, right? And then uh, inside of your top secret, top secret becomes a bucket with multiple different verticals. Sometimes when I was in the military, there's a special compartmented information, SCI, TSSCI, that has different categories. When I was in nuclear weapons with the military, those nuclear weapons specific categories were CAT-6 and CAT-12. The other 10 categories related to different things, aircraft, uh, nuclear submarines, uh, movements of troops, you know, tank weapons, anti-aircraft weapons, whatever it might be. Inside CIA, we have further subcategories that have to do with human intelligence. So you might have a human intelligence security uh, category that is specific to counter narcotics or specific to counter proliferation or specific to uh, Russian operations inside of Russia. Russian operations outside of Russia. It gets super compartmentalized. And the more, the, the deeper into the rabbit hole you go, the more you get that compartment, uh, compartmentalization. All of your, like I've also heard of Q clearances. Q clearances, I think are specific to the military. I think they have to do with, with the people who actually create codes that become the foundation for communication and for nuclear codes and nuclear launch sequences. Um, I'm very likely wrong. But I do know that a Q code, a Q clearance is a real clearance. It's not just from the X-Files. Wow. And so we kind of have this same thing again that we talked about, that almost hourglass shape with regards to um, your level of public exposure also must happen here in that you start off with a very low but incredibly broad type of clearance. You can see everything that is secret. That's not much in terms of the height, but that's everything in terms of the breadth. You get through top secret and then you begin to compartmentalize and you have the different numbers or you have the different subcategories. But then presumably the director and the president, the president has the most high level of clearance that's possible because he has to be able to see everything across all levels of of clearance. Now I imagine that even the president must be compartmentalized mentalized against certain things that he doesn't need to know perhaps right now. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Chris. Just that it's this same situation again, right? That you yeah, compartmentalize a, in and then you bre- the, uh, broaden back out again. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you, when you use that example, it's a very interesting example. Um, there are two things that kind of, that add context to it, right? The first is that the higher, the, the tighter the compartmentalization goes, the stricter, the um, archive and data management process becomes. So, you know, a secret piece of information might literally be written on a piece of paper and might just get handed from person to person with a little rubber stamp that says secret on it. And that's pretty much all the all the positive control you have. And somebody might accidentally drop it in the trash can or light it on fire or, you know, whisk it away and give it to the Russians. Who knows? But when you're getting to those super compartmentalized pieces of information, like you're talking about with the president, Every piece of that data is archived. It's strictly monitored. There's, you know, backup against contingency, against secondary and tertiary monitoring, so that if any of those pieces of information are ever leaked, 
they can be reverse engineered to find out where the leak is. Because, for example, we would never suspect the president of being the person who leaks information. I know there are some conspiracy theorists out there who suspect exactly that, but that we could actually uh, track back the data points to see, was it the president? Was it the briefer? Because every piece of information the president gets comes from a briefer. Was it the person who wrote the article that went into the, the president daily brief? Because everybody, there's a human being who writes that. There's a human being who carries the president's daily brief to the Oval Office every day. That person just that person could open that book and start flipping away pages and taking pictures on their on their cell phone for all we know, right? So all of that information is really heavily guarded and monitored so that they can reverse engineer and find out where the leak is if a leak is ever identified. Is this a combination of physical and digital security then? Because presumably the I know the president's daily briefing is this binder type scenario that gets handed to him. That's something physical, right? Those Correct. are pieces of paper with words printed on them. Correct. Going further back from that, there will be different types of encryption. There will be tracking on the encryption. There will be ways to work out has this. I'm going to guess that maybe tied in with the NSA or something, you may even be able to have a way to search for like plagiarism at university. Does this appear on the web anywhere, web scraping to see if something matches something that was in the daily briefing? Okay, where's this come from? So there must be a, a very complex um, combination of security protocols going on here. Yeah, for sure. And I don't think any of us are really, again, when it comes to level of clearance, there's no need to know. I had no need to know how they protect the president's daily brief. But somebody out there does have that need to know, and that person would know exactly how it's protected. Um, but you are correct in, in your assessment that there's both a mix of digital and physical securities. On the physical side, we call it positive control. Positive control means you don't only have one person in control of something, you actually have two people in control of something. So if you or I are carrying a briefcase with something sensitive in it, positive control does not mean you have the briefcase. Positive control means you and I together have the briefcase. Maybe you're the one that has it in your hands, but I'm right beside you at all times. Maybe I'm the one that has it in my hands, but you're right beside me at all times. So at the end of the day, two people can vouch for every step that that document or that that code may have taken. That's positive control on the physical side. And then you've got all the digital controls because your clearance and your role uh, dictate what you actually have access to within a digital system. It's not that different from corporate America. You can't be a salesperson and log in to the accounting side of the software. You can't be an accountant and log into the sales customer management tool. So there's, there's digital and physical elements that go into protecting everything from the documents uh, all the way to, you know, who the primary top 10 terrorist targets are that are going to get neutralized this week. If you like this short clip, make sure you click here to see the next clip or here to see the full podcast episode.